Hello, everyone. My name is John Foster from the University of Texas at Austin, and I'll be chairing this semi-plenary session. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today my colleague at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences, Professor Omar Gattas. Dr. Gattas is a professor of geological sciences and mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the co-director, I'm sorry, he is the director of the Center for Computational Geoscientists Sciences and Optimization in the Odin Institute and holds the John A. and Catherine G. Jackson Chair in Computational Geosciences. He's a member of the Faculty in Computational Science, Engineering, and Mathematics Interdisciplinary PhD program in the Odin Institute and holds courtesy appointments in computer science and biomedical engineering. Uh, that's five different departments if you've been counting. Before moving to UT Austin in 2005, he spent 16 years on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. He holds BSc, MS, and PhD degrees from Duke University. With collaborators, he's received the ACM Gordon Bell Prize in 2003 and again in 2015, and was a finalist on three other occasions. He received the 2019 SIAM Computational Science and Engineering Best Paper Prize and the SIAM and the 2019 SIAM Geosciences Career Prize. He's also a fellow of SIAM. Before I turn the floor over, I'd like to remind everyone that as you are watching the talk, if you have a question for Professor Gattas, use the Ask Omar Gattas tab on the left side of the platform. And if there's time, your question will be addressed. Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. And many thanks to the organizers for this invitation to speak at this 30th anniversary of the first US NCCM. I was actually back there, I was there back then in 1991 as a young assistant professor. And in the you know 30 years since, uh, the computational mechanics community and USACM have played an important role in my career development and of course provided me with many friendships. So I'm very grateful for that and honored to be speaking on this 30th anniversary. So the topic of my talk is uh, the, the prospects for constructing neural network surrogates uh, that can serve as reliable approximations of the parameter to observable map that is crucial for solution of Bayesian inverse problems. The slides for this talk are available at this link down here. So if anyone is interested, screen, you know, go ahead and screenshot this right now so we can download those slides. There's a lot more detail in the slides than I'm going to have time to cover today. Uh, so you can, you can dig in, you can see references and theorems and things like that. This is joint work with uh, several current and former postdocs, students and research scientists. And I've highlighted there Tom O'Leary Roseberry, whose uh, dissertation uh, contains the neural network approximation of theoretic work. Uh, and the bottom line of, of people there are the ones who worked on the Antarctic inverse problem that I'm going to show applications to. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start off by talking about Bayesian inverse problems and why they're so difficult to solve and give an example. And the goal in an inverse problem is to infer the parameters from data through the lens of a model. And here we have, in general, high fidelity PDE models in mind. These are typically infinite dimensional parameter fields. And so upon discretization, you end up with very high dimensional inverse problems. We'd like to use the framework of Bayesian inverse theory because we would like to quantify uncertainties in the inference. The, the solution of a Bayesian inverse problem is a probability distribution, so-called posterior probability distribution. So this is a, a probability distribution in a million dimensions. Uh, and so the challenge really is how do we compute quantities of interest uh, from this distribution, mean moments, uh, such as covariance and higher moments, quantiles, predictive quantities of interest, uh, failure probabilities, and so on. And this forms a basis for decision-making under uncertainty. Uh, but these are challenging, you know, sampling a probab probability distribution, computing the mean and, and moments of probability distribution in a million dimensions is, uh, is, is extremely challenging. And then when you add on top of it, the fact that, that to comp compute any point on that surface requires a solution of the forward problem. If you've got complex PDEs, the combination of dimensionality and complexity makes the whole thing prohibitive. Okay, so the question is, can we use neural networks 
uh, to serve as, as surrogates for the parameter to observable map that shows up. Uh, and the answer is, well, we're going to have to exploit problem structure. So the question is, how do we do that? Okay, uh, so just as an illustration here, this is what the posterior probability distribution looks like when you have Gaussian noise, additive Gaussian noise, Gaussian prior, and this is after discretization. So everything I'm gonna show here is after discretization. You could put everything into the infinite dimensional framework and it requires a, a, a number of technical details, but most of the ideas go through. The ideas generally go through with appropriate definition of, of, of the prior. So pi post is the posterior distribution. M here are the, the parameters. And I use the term parameter uh, generally to imply not just model parameters, but initial conditions, boundary conditions, source terms, even geometry or model structure, anything that's uncertain in the model that you'd like to infer from the data. Uh, Q of M is the parameter to observable map. So, you know, th this implies the parameters injecting and in, you know, being injected into the model, the solution of the model, and then the, the state of the model. There's an observation operator applied to the state, which extracts the observable quantities of interest. Okay, so that's what Q of M is. And those observables are then compared to the actual observations weighted by the noise covariance, gamma noise. Um, and you know, the smaller this is, the higher the probability that any particular uh, set of parameters is consistent with the model. There's another term that comes from the prior. And so the closer the parameters are to the mean of the prior M naught, uh, weighted by the prior covariance, again, the closer they are, the higher the probability that these are the parameters that are consistent with, with, the, with in this case, with the prior. Uh, so together, this is what the posterior looks like in the special case of a Gaussian prior and Gaussian noise. Okay, so uh, what, what's the problem? What's the challenge? Well, the challenge is just to evaluate this density at any point requires solving the forward problem, Q of M. Okay? Um, and the Q of M is an implicitly defined operator. It depends on the solution of a forward PDE in which the state U is to be solved given parameters M. Uh, so whenever we're sampling that, so we, can't, we, we cannot analytically compute moments and any quantities of interest we care about from the posterior in general. We can't do it in general. Uh, and so we have to uh, effectively sample this, this posterior density. There are alternatives, uh, but in general, sort of the, the reference method is to use Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample pi. And, every, and as you try to sample pi, you have to evaluate the forward problem uh, for any given sample. Right? So that's, that's the challenge We're in very high dimensions and Q of M is expensive. Here's an example to fix ideas. Uh, we're interested in solving the inverse problem for the flow of ice in the Antarctic ice sheet. So ice flows under the action of gravity towards the coast. And this is what leads to sea level rise. Uh, you have fast flowing ice regions are shown in the warmer colors. And so this corresponds to a few kilometers per year. Uh, the, um, you know, the interior, the flow is a few meters per year. So three orders of magnitude variation in flow velocities. You can see these ice streams uh, in these various regions. Uh, this region in particular is one of concern. Ice has been thinning there over the last several decades that observations have been made. Uh, mass is being lost uh, to the ocean. And it's thought that this catchment in here is uh, responsible or would be responsible for seven meters of sea level rise if, you know, if the ice uh, destabilized. Um, you have ice floating on water that's known as an ice shelf. And the oceans, the polar oceans have been warming and you know, we've seen some of these ice shells disintegrate, uh, collapse, uh, and when they collapse, that leads to a loss of buttressing effect and one can get larger flow into the ocean. So we'd like to predict this process. The problem is we don't know the boundary condition at the base of the ice. Okay? Uh, the ice can be frozen to the rock, in which case you have a no slip boundary condition. It can be sliding freely due to fluids underneath in which case you have a free slip boundary condition, or we can have anything in between. And we'll see in a minute how we phenomenologically uh, model that. Uh, but that's, that's really the, the largest uncertainty. There are other uncertainties in the topography. But we, can, you know, we can extract the topography from radar imaging, uh, the rheology of ice, but we can do experiments in the, in the lab. Uh, the geothermal heat flux is 
um, is, is uncertain, but we have models for it. So the first order uncertainty is in the actual boundary condition. What's the ice doing on the on the basal surface? Okay, so. Fortunately, we have many observational uh, data, and in particular, what we're going to use here is INSAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, which gives us the surface velocities. So we uh, we can capture through satellite from satellites the surface. In fact, this is this is what you see here. These are surface velocities. We can capture those, and then solve an inverse problem to go from uh, the surface velocities down to infer the boundary condition. Okay, forward problem is given the boundary condition. Tell me what the surface velocities are. And the inverse is the reverse. All right. So this is just a depiction of the complicated state of the basal surface. You actually have lakes down there uh, and due to frictional heating, due to the geothermal heat flux, and just due to fluids left over back 35 million years ago when there was no ice on Antarctica. Uh, these are the governing equations. Everyone will be familiar with the balance of linear mass, momentum, and energy. Uh, this is a ice is modeled as a creeping non-Newtonian fluid, so it has a nonlinear rheology. Uh, the effective viscosity depends on, in an arrhenius way, on temperature theta, uh, inverse of temperature, uh, and it also depends on the second invariant of the strain rate tensor. Here, n is a a, a positive greater than one uh, number, and the the exponent is therefore negative. So you have a shear thinning fluid. As you increase the shear rate, the viscosity decreases. Uh, there, there's a free surface boundary condition. Um, and, but what we, what's really critical here is this uh, basal friction boundary condition. It's a phenomenological condition. And essentially what it says is this is the tangential operator. So the tangential component of the traction at the base is proportional to the tangential component of velocity. And this proportionality, uh, here we've reparametrized it because the, this, this coefficient varies over nine orders of magnitude or more in, in a realistic ice sheet. Uh, so we're working with a log of the coefficient. So beta is the log of what is known as the basal friction, it's not a true friction, but it represents a resistance to sliding. And what we're trying to do is infer the beta. Uh, and so beta is a field, you know, you saw that in the previous slide, it lives everywhere. You discretize it, you might get a million dimensions. You might get a million parameters and it can vary again from very from no slip to full slip and everything in between. Okay, so how do we go about solving this, this inverse problem? Uh, well, we're going to do two things. We're going to exploit the geometry of the parameter observable map as revealed through the inverse Hessian of the log posterior. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and so understanding sort of these narrow valleys as the, as the probabilities concentrate is going to help us in sampling, particularly when we're in very high dimensions. The other thing that's going to help us is the intrinsic low dimensionality. So the map from parameters to observables uh, is typically smoothing. Uh, they, it admits a low, a low dimensional representation. Not all of these million parameters can affect all million surface observations. That's just not how nature works. So we want to exploit that fact as well. Uh, and then ultimately, we're going to, you know, despite all of our best efforts, we, we cannot, we, in the end, even using these two devices, we're not able to fully characterize the, the non-Gaussian posterior. And so what we're going to do is replace the parameters observable map with a, with a neural network surrogate, but we're going to make use of uh, these, these, the, these two characteristics that we can exploit. Okay, uh, so here's an illustration. Suppose we're trying to sample, just a two-dimensional illustration, we're trying to sample the probability distribution whose contours are given in gray. The classical Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, Metropolis Hastings, variant works like this. You posit a proposal distribution that you know how to draw samples from. You draw a sample. Okay, so I'm at this point in the Markov chain. I draw a sample. Maybe it's there. And if it's an uphill, if it's a higher probability, we accept it. You know, we, we'd like to sample higher probability regions. But if it's down the hill, we don't throw it away. We accept it with a certain probability, depending on how low it is. Okay, Why? Because we want to sample low probability regions. Now, the problem with this, this is known as a Gaussian random walk, it's an isotropic Gaussian. The problem is it's terrible. It's useless in high dimensions because you know, it doesn't really know about the underlying distribution. So if you use this as a, as a proposal, think, think of preconditioner. You know, if it doesn't look anything like the target distribution, it's going to be hopeless. You're going to reject lots of samples. Each sample, we have to pay the cost of an ice sheet solve. And by the way, here, an ice sheet solve is not terribly, it's not a, a full climate model, but you know, it's, 
four minutes on 4,000 processors. Yeah, yeah, there's a price to be paid. And these sampling can go on for tens of thousands, if not tens of millions uh, of samples. All right, so instead what we do is we exploit our knowledge that we can efficiently calculate the Hessian of um, the, the parameter to observable map, okay? So that's what we're doing here. Uh, at this black point, the blue contours respect or, or conform to, um, the, uh, to, the, to the second derivative of the target distribution. So the, the second derivative is matched between the blue contours and the gray contours, those two distributions at this point, okay? Um, and so we compute the Hessian of the underlying uh, gray distribution, and we use that to construct the proposal. Now, you know, the actual structure perhaps is, is, is not necessary. The important thing is you can see locally, it captures the concentration of, of, of probability. It, it so it captures these long stretched valleys. And this helps us if we draw a sample, uh, then there will be a much greater likelihood that a sample will be accepted. Uh, now we'll, we'll get to back in a second. You're thinking, well, how are we going to compute this Hessian? You know, we need the inverse of the Hessian. We need the determinant of the square root of the Hessian. And the Hessian is not an operator we can compute. Every column of the Hessian requires one linearized forward solve. In a million dimensions, we need a million forward solves. That's out of the question. So we cannot compute the Hessian. You have to think of the Hessian like an integral operator. It's not something, it's a dense operator. You don't compute it, you have to exploit its structure. All right, so, but before I talk about that, let's just see how well this works. Uh, th these are two um, sort of off the shelf methods. One uses, this one uses derivatives, the Langevin method. Uh, this is delayed projection adaptive metropolis, which does not use any derivative information. Uh, what we're plotting here in the vertical axis is the, uh, as a measure of convergence of the Markov chains. And the horizontal axis is the number of samples. This is actually 200, if you look closely, it's 250,000 samples. So they're nowhere near converging. Now, what about this, this method that we're calling stochastic Newton? I mean, there are different variants of it. Um, and uh, uh, the, well, that's here. You, you, you just can't even see it. It's in fact, if you blow it up, you can see the red curve right there. Um, and that's, so it's very rapidly converging. Of course, the problem is, yeah, but every sample, you know, it requires this, this computation of the determinant of the square root of the Hessian. How do we do this? Uh, this is the key, this is the key slide in, in the whole talk. Uh, and we're going to use these ideas when, when we get to constructing the neural network. Uh, for um, many inverse problems, the key property is that the parameter to observable map is intrinsically low dimensional. This is the source of ill posedness. The you know, given data, you cannot, you cannot go back. You, you, don't, you don't have a unique solution. It's not even stable in, in the case of most ill posed inverse problems. Um, so uh, what is the idea then? There's, well, if I look at the Hessian, so this, this you know, Hessian that I talked about previously, if I compute its eigenvalues, I see that they collapse uh, like this. And, and you know, this is the log curve. So they're collapsing over eight orders of magnitude. So the first 5,000 modes out of a million, 1.2 million, uh, this is where the action is. This is where the data inform the parameters. And everything else is just the prior. So we don't need the PDE. We don't need the expense of solving on a big supercomputer. Uh, so it's just these 5,000 dimensions that, that, that are important as far as the, the PDE model goes. And notice I've actually plotted the spectrum of the Hessian for two different meshes. I've got a coarse mesh, 400,000, and a fine mesh of 1.2 million. The spectra lie on top of each other. So not only do these problems admit an intrinsic low dimensional representation, but it's also dimension independent. So these 5,000 modes uh, it doesn't matter, you know, once you get to a sufficiently fine mesh that you are able to accept the, any, any, the information that the data are providing you, any further refinement does not change the nature of the problem. The ambient dimension increases, but the intrinsic dimension does not. All right, so that's property number one is low dimensionality. Um, and, the, uh, and, and so this invites a low rank approximation. So we're just going to truncate, okay? Now the problem is, um, how I just said we can't compute the Hessian. So how are we going to extract the dominant eigenvalues? Well, we use a matrix-free method. And um, in particular, we use randomized SVD. Randomized SVD is, uh, doesn't require the Hessian. It just needs the uh, probing of the Hessian in random directions. So we just do matrix vector multiplications in random directions. Uh, and, and that allows us to extract the Hessian. Key thing is it requires only two R matrix vector products. 
uh, where R is the effective rank, 5,000 in, in this case. And for other problems, the rank is much smaller. Um, now, we need Hessian vector products. How do, you, how do you get those Hessian vector products? Well, it involves two forward adjoint PDE solves. Okay, so the cost of two forward adjoint PDE solves, you can get Hessian vector products and you only need two R of them. So even though you're in N dimensions, million dimensions, um, it's, you, you only have to operate in these 5,000 dimensions and that tells you everything you need to know about the Hessian. It seems like it's too good to be true, it violates some sort of you know, law of physics or something, but, but no, that's, 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 that's what you have when you have randomized SVD plus adjoint based Hessian vector products. Uh, we can often prove that this uh, that the spectrum behaves like this for certain model problems, elliptic, parabolic, and, and even certain hyperbolic problems. Uh, for elliptic problems, typically the decay is algebraic. For hyper, for parabolic, it's it's exponential decay. You can get uh, parabolic inverse problems that require only ten important directions. Um, but uh, and you can also prove this independent of the parameter, not just the parameter dimension, but also the data dimension. You know, we have that surface in SAR map. Remember that. If we, you know, if we extract a finer resolution uh, from the satellite observations, that doesn't change this basic property. Okay, um, and and this is due to just information that's lost when you map from the boundary conditions at the base of the ice sheet to the surface velocity, you lose information, and that loss of information that is you know, that that's what's telling you, you know, that these eigenvalues decay. Uh, in fact, we can um, we can uh, relate this to information theory and. Uh, under the Gaussian approximation, expected information gained from the data can be written in this form. It's a sum of the first R eigenvalues, and it's, it's actually not, it's, it's the log of one plus the eigenvalues. So when the, um, this is the information gained. So each eigenvalue represents a contribution to, to knowledge we've gained from the data. And when the eigenvalues are small relative to one, and that's what this cutoff is, uh, then we can try it. Okay, that's the basic idea. Uh, I've included in the slides the randomized SVD algorithm for people who are interested. I'm not going to talk about it here, but the key thing is you have two places in the algorithm in which you're multiplying the Hessian with random vectors. R is a random matrix uh, that's tall and thin uh, that has R columns. Okay, um, and you can you can prove an error bound on this randomized algorithm. It comes, you know, the the, the optimal is is deterministic SVD. Uh, so the error is based on the discarded eigenvalues, the trailing eigenvalues, right, from R plus one to N. Randomized SVD, the expected error also has that term, but it has a prefactor, but you can, you can make the prefactor arbitrarily small by choosing a bit of oversampling. You can, you can choose some oversampling. It's not just R, R plus 10 or 20, and that reduces this constant. And so you come within a small constant of optimal. Okay, so that's randomized SVD. That is what allows you to do Hessian vector products, just two R of them to extract the dominant part of the spectrum. The other thing is, of course, we need that the the Hessian vector product amounts to a, a forward and adjoint pair, a linearized forward and adjoint pair. Again, I'm not going to go through this. It's an exercise in variational calculus and Lagrangian, um, Lagrangian functionals. Uh, but you can just sit down, paper and pencil, and you can derive it. You know, and I'll just, just you know, just in the eyeball norm, you know, there is, um, we have to solve two PDEs, you know, this PDE, which resembles the original uh, nonlinear Stokes equations and this adjoint PDE. Uh, so the operator on the left-hand side is the same as the original one, uh, as linearized original one. The operator, the right-hand side is more complicated, but you can just work these things out. Nowadays, we actually have symbolic um, symbolic differentiation software that would let us uh, uh, work, actually that knows how to do variational calculus. And we have a library that will give a link at the end. Okay, so how does this all work? Um, well, uh, this is the, again, just the spectrum of the Hessian. When I say the Hessian, it's the data misfit Hessian. It's not the prior term. You know, the prior generally is going to be full. Uh, it doesn't admit a low rank approximation. It acts like a differential operator, but the data misfit Hessian is the one that's a compact operator. And so this is showing a few selected eigenvalues, uh, sorry, eigenvectors, one, seven, 100, 500, and 4,000. So this is about the last one that we trust this is sort of the limits of what the data are telling us. Everything else is just noise, and the prior is just going to come in and cover uh, for that. Um, so what you can see is it kind of looks like the mode shapes of a drum. You know, you have, uh, but but highly heterogeneous. So this is you know, West Antarctica, this is East. Now it's you're getting into sort of a higher mode. Uh, so it's like a you know a membrane that has maybe variable thickness. Uh, and what you see is. Um, you not only get strong heterogeneity as you go into these higher modes, but you also get 
uh, strong anisotropy. And let's blow up this one here. You can see along this ice stream, for example, uh, you can see in the stream, uh, in, in the streamwise direction, you have a high, very high mode, uh, whereas um, along the stream, you have just a first mode. You know, same thing over here, except you, know, you have like a third mode up here, first mode down there. Okay, so there's a very strong uh, anis anisotropy and heterogeneity. Okay, so taking all this together, what does this let us do? Again, these are the observations. This is from synthetic aperture radar. This is what we're able to compute as the, the so-called map point maximum a posteriori point. This maximizes the posterior probability. And uh, you know, it tells us that, well, there's actually, this is very close to no slip. You know, zero, zero would be no slip. The, the, by the way, this is the cube root of that beta, the, the basal friction parameter, the cube root of it. So it actually varies over nine orders of magnitude. And we see close to, to free slip, uh, did I say no slip? Anyway, close to free slip near the coast, these red regions indicate no resistance to sliding, negligible resistance to sliding. Uh, so if one of these ice shelves does collapse, um, I mean, this is the loss, it's probably not gonna collapse anytime soon, but if it does, that means that there is unrestricted flow, that, that, that the ice can just flow downhill. You know, ice flows under gravity, thicker in the interior, so we can get ice flowing into the ocean. Um, on the other hand, in the interior, we have close to a no slip boundary condition, but this is, this is just a best estimate. It doesn't tell us anything about the uncertainty. So that's what this picture shows over here. This is the, um, the, so the variance, the diagonal of the co posterior covariance. Uh, it's actually the standard, standard deviations, so square root of that. And it shows large uncertainty in the interior, uh, but significantly less uncertainty out uh, near these coastal regions where you have the fast flowing ice. So the fast flowing ice, these ice streams, is telegraphing, it's telling us what's happening at the base, providing more information about the boundary condition. Um, all right, so in uh, summary, um, we're able to characterize the uncertainty in, the, in this problem, actually quite complicated problem, by exploiting these two key properties. One is the intrinsic low dimensionality, and the second is the geometry of the primitive verbal map. Despite all of that, it still took 100,000 linearized forward solves, um, which amounts to 10 million core hours. So that's expensive, but here's the key thing. It's just the Laplace approximation of the posterior. The Laplace approximation is a Gaussianized posterior. Its mean is given by the map point and its covariance is given by the inverse of the Hessian computed at the map maximum a posteriori point. Uh, We've done subsequent studies with smaller regions of, of the ice sheet uh, and, and confirmed that this is a reasonable approximation. Uh, but, you know, the, so the departure from, from Gaussianity is not large, uh, but that's on the small regions. You know, for, for the full blown ice sheet, we don't know that. We haven't, we ha we're not able to do full blown Markov chain Monte Carlo like that Metropolis Hastings algorithm I described earlier. It would require about 10 to the seventh full results, so about a billion core hours. It's just not sustainable. Um, so we desperately need some kind of surrogate. Okay, so what can we do for surrogates? Well, surrogates have been around for decades. Gaussian processes, you know, polynomial chaos, orthogonal polynomials, radial basis functions. But generally, these suffer in high dimensions because of dimensionality. Um, and um, they're, they're generally not going to not going to work in million dimensions. Um, on the other hand, deep neural networks have emerged as promising alternatives for essentially representing functions in high dimensions. Some theoretical work, uh, Christoph Schwab and others have been doing on, um, on, uh, on cursive dimension, uh, you know, beating the cursive dimensionality, dimension independent approximation properties. Um, but the DNN's successes have generally come, you know, from Silicon Valley and so on in the large data regime. So assuming you have a lot of training data, uh, you know, Netflix will mine, you know, billions of consumer preferences and, and try to predict what you're going to, you know, like to watch next, what movie you'd like to watch next. We don't have that luxury. You know, you talk to a climate scientist, and they'll tell you we can run a global climate model 30 times. Okay. Well, 30, probably you're not going to get anywhere with 30, but you know, maybe a few hundred. Can, can, we, can we get away with a few hundred? So the training data are extremely expensive to obtain because they involve you know, running the full blown ice sheet. Uh, so our approach is going to be to these two very properties that I just talked about, exploiting geometry and intrinsic low dimensionality using randomized SVD and adjoint based Hessian vector products and, and the notion of the Hessian as a local approximation uh, of concentration of probability. 
Uh, so we're going to use those two properties to architect a custom neural network that we hope is going to be accurate given small, uh, a limited number of training data. Right, so that's the plan. Um, and uh, by now, everyone knows what a neural network is. So I'm going to skip a few slides here. Uh, but you know, it's a, it's a nonlinear composition of of, uh, of nonlinear activation functions, um, and uh, you. Okay, hmm. there were some slides. Oh, okay. I guess this this section, yeah, this section should have appeared earlier. Okay. Uh, so, and then of course, you know that you, know, you have this representation, you have to train it, you have to infer the parameters in the representation from the training data, uh, and you solve a you know, risk, empirical risk minimization uh, problem for the weights of the neural network, okay, given training data. All right, um, now the, the challenge is going to be if you're trying to learn the parameter to observable map, so the input parameters would be, in this case, the discretized basal friction at the base of ice sheet, so this is a million dimensions, and then the output would be the discretized surface velocities uh, provided by, by, well, provided in, in the model you know, by the output velocity of the surface. Um, and so this is million dimensional, this is million dimensional, and it's hopeless, right? Because with at least with a vanilla dense network, you're going to get a million squared, so 10 to the 12th order weights. You need you know, a zillions of training data to infer those weights. So that's, that's out of the question. Uh, so instead, um, you try to invoke some kind of dimension reduction uh, device. Convolutional networks have been very, very powerful, very successful for imaging data. Problem is, this is not imaging data. You know, this is an unstructured, irregular mesh on the basal surface. Um, but uh, there, there have been, you know, extensions, attempts to extend convolution uh, CNNs to uh, manifolds. This is known as geometric learning. Uh, it's an ongoing research. There are interesting ideas there. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is make use of the known properties of the map, uh, and the fact that you know that we can compute second derivatives, we can compute, um, we can we can extract intrinsic low dimensionality. That's what we want to do. Uh, so here is the idea. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, what we're going to do: we take the million dimensional inputs, and the first layer is simply going to be uh, these eigenvectors that you just saw. Okay. So we're going to find a basis. Uh, for a reduced space representation of the input parameters, and that's going to come from the dominant eigenvectors of the Hessian, of the data, mis data misfit Hessian. And uh, we do the same thing on the output because you know the output dimension admits a low rank, a, a low dimensional representation as well. Okay, so these first layers are linear layers, and uh, the weights in them will be predetermined by um, these these projections by, by by these bases that we compute. Okay, and then in between. That's where we where we insert the neural network. Okay, uh, so how do we get the input basis? Sort of already talked about it. There is a twist though. Uh, so this is the, the this is the uh, data misfit Hessian. It's actually the Jacobian of the parameter observable map transpose Jacobian. In fact, it's known as the Gauss-Newton Hessian. Um, and so we take the Gauss-Newton Hessian, and uh, it's not enough to compute it at one point, as I was showing you. Uh, we need the expectation over the input parameter space. Okay. Now, in practice, we don't you know, we don't sample this very finely. We, in fact, we just we just compute this at the training data, a few hundred training data. This is where we evaluate this, uh, and then we solve a generalized eigenvalue problem for these dominant eigenvectors, which will form the basis uh, that I talked about the initial restriction. Um, and of course, we don't you know we never form the Hessian. You know, I said oh we we construct this. Well, we don't construct it. We only construct actions on vectors using randomized SVD. Okay, so what does the theory tell us? Well, uh, the quality of this approximation can be bounded by the discarded eigenvalues, the trailing eigenvalues. So we truncate at a certain r as the eigen, you know, eigenvalues decay. We truncate at a certain r, and the error in the true parameter observable map and the parameter observable map that is constructed by this reduced basis. Uh, is given by or is bounded from above by the eigenvalues we threw away. When the eigenvalues decay rapidly, you can get a very efficient representation with a low dimensional basis. Okay, um, and and there's a, a paper last year from Yusuf Mansu, Paul Constantine Company, um, that uh, that contains these proofs. That's the input basis. Now it's tempting on the output to just reverse. This is Jacobian transpose Jacobian. So it's tempting just to reverse it into the data space and make it Jacobian Jacobian transpose, right? If I if I reverse this and make it Jacobian Jacobian transpose of the parameter observable map, 
then I have a data space session and I can do the same thing. And in fact, our code has that capability. Uh, but in practice, we do something simpler and often works as well, maybe sometimes even better. Uh, and that, that is, we just take the output, output Q. So Q is the, let's say the observations of uh, the observable velocities everywhere on the surface. And we just compute QQ transpose. And then we average that over input space. And then we do a spectral uh, decomposition, a truncated spectral decomposition. Uh, all right. And then in that case, you can show that the error that you incur, so just on the output side, the error that you incur in representing uh, the parameter, oops, parameter observable map uh, is given by the truncated, again, truncated eigenvalues. Okay. So putting it all together, um, and Tom and Tom's thesis, he worked out this bound uh, of the total error that's committed uh, is in fact just the, is bounded from above just by just by the sum of the truncated, truncated eigenvalues. Uh, all right. So that leaves us then to invoke a neural network representation. So this is now fully nonlinear representation uh, in the reduced space of inputs to outputs. And uh, here, you, in fact, most cases, we just do a dense, you know, a standard multilayer perceptron uh, because it's the problem is small enough that we can just do that. There's no need to do further reduction. Although Tom's code does have facilities to do further reductions using sparse linear algebra and, and a few other low rank approximations. But in general, the examples I'm going to show you, this is just a dense neural network since it's such a small dimension anyway. All right, so let's look at some uh, examples. I have time uh, for um, just one, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just do one example because I want to talk about an extension at the end. And the, uh, so there's the, the, uh, a nonlinear convection diffusion reaction equation where the coefficient of the nonlinear reaction, there's a cubic nonlinearity, uh, the coefficient of that is the parameter of interest, or more properly, the log coefficient. So M here is the parameter of uh, interest. And the parameter to observable map simply evaluates uh, the solution, the state, at 100 points in domain. Uh, there's also contained in the slides, you can look at those later on, uh, is a Hemholtz problem, uh, which is a bit more difficult, that uh, contains, that, that essentially it's a log uh, wave speed or wave slowness. Uh, that is the parameter, and we're observing the wave, the wave field at 200 points. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is um, results on on successive refinements of a mesh from 64 squared to 192 squared mesh. So you know, 4,000 input parameters, 37,000 input parameters, um, and we're going to uh, look here first at just to confirm that the eigenvalues do decay. You know, as I said earlier, we can prove this theoretically for certain model problems, but these are typically simple model problems like the parabolic and whatnot. Uh, and then for more complicated problems, nonlinear problems, we just numerically evaluate it. But we can see that the eigenvalues do decay rapidly. This is what, eight orders of magnitude reduction in the eigenvalues over just 100, uh, 100 modes um, out of either 4,000 or 37,000. So you have two meshes on top of each other, which this shows also dimension independence. The highest modes, you can see a slight difference there. Um, and so maybe a further, um, further refinement would be necessary. Uh, and uh, in fact, we're going to be very aggressive here. We're going to truncate at eight. So we're just going to truncate at eight. Um, and you know, again, the argument is we want to keep the inner dimension small because we want to keep the neural network low dimension. And by keeping the, the neural network living in low dimensions, it means it has a small number of weights. And because it has a small number of weights, it won't need much training data. And you, you'll see this justified in a second. Okay. So this justifies the, the truncation. And now I'm going to um, draw your attention to uh, two curves here. First of all, we're plotting accuracy against the number of training data. So this is generalization accuracy. So how the, the this surrogate representation, how well it works on unseen data. And we're going to look at that as a function of how much training data you have available. And remember, you know, we're in this low training data regime. That's, that's where large scale you know, computational science lives. Uh, so the, the, first of all, there's a full space network, and then there will be this, this uh, projected network um, that you see in blue. This is, we're labeling this as active subspace. In between, uh, there are several variants. I, I'm not going to talk about those, but there, 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 there are several choices in between. Okay? And what you see is the full space network uh, is, is not very good in the low training regime. Uh, you know, at maybe 200 training data, it's about 70% accurate. 
Um, and then, you know, as you increase the training data, it starts to catch up. Uh, but the uh, here's a blow up on the on the right of just this this top piece. Um, and so the on the other hand, the the parsimonious or projected network it maintains you know 90 95 percent accuracy um, even in you know 90, 92 93 percent accuracy even in, in with 200 training data. Okay, this is for a coarse mesh. Now we go to a fine mesh, and, by, and again just to emphasize the inner dimension is only eight here. Just eight. You know, can, of course, we can increase the inner dimension to get a more accurate representation, but then we need more training data. Um, the full space network required uh, 440,000 weights, so that's why it needs a lot of training data. Whereas this parsimonious network requires a thousand. Uh, the um, and this is now with a finer mesh, and you see things get even worse. The full space network now at 200 training data is only 37 percent accurate. Uh, whereas the parsimonious network maintains its uh, its accuracy it hasn't changed because of this dimension independence that we've been talking about, and you can see why you know you need 3.7 million weights to represent to characterize the full space network, so you need a ton of training data. Okay, uh, there's a Hemholtz problem, similar sorts of results, uh, but I want to leave a couple minutes just to talk about this extension to design optimization. Uh, and the idea is the following. By the way, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Joaquin Martins and Shaoshan Zhu at the University of Michigan, and my colleagues here, Karen Wilcox and Anurban Chaudhry. And the idea here is uh, that we don't have to use th this notion of a parsimonious or a projected neural network to represent just the parameter to observable map, meaning the forward problem. We can also use it to represent the solution of an optimization problem. So. Uh, if you want to do CFD based design optimization, this is super expensive. You know, this, is, this is crazy expensive because uh, for any set of, of design requirements, you're not just going to solve the flow. You know, you're not going to do a flow solve once. You're going to do repeated, you know, hundreds, possibly thousands of CFD uh, simulations. Right. Uh, so uh, the idea is, can we learn the map from design requirements? For example, lift and moment bounds, geometric constraints, environmental parameters such as Mach and Reynolds number. And you know, at each point along the flight trajectory across the flight envelope, can we learn the map from these design requirements to the optimal design variables? Okay, so the solution of the shape optimization problem. And if you could construct a representation like that, then it would be easy to do preliminary design studies and deploy it widely. And you don't need all the technology of CFD-based, adjoint-based shape optimization with moving meshes and 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 parameterizations that are that vary smoothly and are differentiable. This is a whole. A whole, you know, it took Kim 20 years, uh, Kim Martins and his group, you know, 20, 25 years to build up this very powerful framework they have right now. So that's what we're going to do. Now, what's the difference? The key difference is this. The uh, problem before was a parameter to observable map, which included the solution of the forward problem. Here, the problem is an optimization problem. And I'm just going to illustrate this for the simple case of unconstrained optimization. Um, in general, we're going to have bounds and things like that. But, um, you know, if we have time, we can talk about what the differences are. Uh, so. Uh, if you have an unconstrained optimization, X are the shape variables, the design variables, and P are these design requirements. So we're interested in the mapping from P to X star, the optimal shape. Uh, that is implicitly defined through the uh, vanishing of the gradient. First order optimality condition, the gradient is zero. So the gradient um, is zero. This equation implicitly has a, um, a, uh, a, a um, it captures the, the, the mapping from P to X star the requirements to the X star. You can compute the, you can derive the sensitivity equations. Okay, so I just take the sensitivity of this and um, DG DX is nothing but the Hessian. The derivative of the gradient respect to the variables is the Hessian. Uh, and I can solve for the sensitivity of the optimal shape with respect to the design requirement vector. Uh, and this is the Jacobian now that I care about. Okay, so not the Jacobian we had before, the Jacobian parameter observable map that showed up everywhere. This is the Jacobian we deal with now. Everything else is the same. All these projected neural network ideas are the same. Uh, and as long as you just replace it with this Jacobian, Hessian inverse, the derivative of the gradient with respect to the design requirement parameters. Okay. Um, now, of course, we never construct the inverse of the Hessian. That's an operator you never touch, but we can hit it with random vectors from either side, depending on whether we want to reduce the input dimension or the output dimension. All right. How well does this work? Here is a uh, a, 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 um, a wing shape optimization problem. Uh, and what you're seeing here, now this is using the full-blown mock arrow framework. So this is CFD, it's, it's actually Reynolds average number Stokes. Uh, 
the flow solver and the shape optimizations built around that. This is available from the MDO lab at Michigan uh, at this uh, GitHub site. Uh, so this is a baseline. Uh, and then this is an optimized, these are pressure contours on the wing. You can see you know, broader regions of, 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 of flattered uh, pressure. Uh, so it's an improved design, it's an optimal design according to the criteria that we have. Um, so we're now going to use a neural network to learn this mapping. And the mapping is going to be from the blue parameters. So these would be the, the design requirements, so the prescribed lift coefficient, a uh, lower bound on the moment coefficient, uh, a volume bound and a thickness bound and a Reynolds number. So it's a relatively low, this is you know, our first attempt. So it's a relatively low dimensional input, five dimensional input, uh, but the outputs are quite large, 210 dimensional output. These are the optimal shape variables. The objective function is to minimize the drag uh, coefficient. Okay, so um, we go through all the machinery that we just, that we talked about, but now with this different definition of the Jacobian, uh, we have 320 training data and 100 testing data. Um, and we can see that it doesn't make sense to compress the input dimension. It's already pretty small. So we only compress the output dimension, but we went from 210 down to eight. So 25 X reduction in layer depth. And because we have this large reduction in the network uh, that allows us to um, use much less training data. So in this case with uh, 320 uh, training data for this mapping from, you know, from what formerly would be five to 210 um, parameters, uh, we achieved 23% lower generalization error. And you can see here, uh, this, is the, um, this is the cutoff, this is the, the decay in the eigenvalues. And you can see we're, we're pretty, you know, pretty aggressively cutting it off at the eighth uh, one, we could achieve higher accuracy. Okay, so um, in the last, uh, so I'll, I'll just summarize, I'm done. Um, the, the, what are the issues? Uh, every you know every method has issues. The 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 fundamental assumption we have here is that we have a low rank approximation. So the, 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 we have a viable low rank approximation of this prior precondition Hessian. Uh, we have shown this numerically for many problems. You see a long list of them uh, here, uh, but it's not universal. Uh, and there are problems in which the information dimension grows with certain parameters you care about. So the decay in the eigenvalue slows down. In particular, for wave propagation problems with increasing frequency, the eigenvalues became more slowly just because there's more information coming from the data. Smaller wavelengths can see smaller features. Uh, in, in convection-dominated flows, same sort of thing happens. As you increase the Reynolds number, the Peclet number, uh, there is more information preserved in observations of the flow. Uh, so, uh, and this is connected to, you know, to, to distorted methods and, and Kolmogorov end bits. Um, so what can we do? We've had some success with H matrix approximations and translate, translation invariant approximations. I'll just refer you to those papers, uh, but it's not clear how to map those onto networks. You know, it's clear a low rank approximation is a, you know, a sort of a bow tie structure, but with these other ones, it's not clear. Um, okay, and there are a number of other issues there, but this is sort of the fundamental one. This is where our research is, is, is going right now. I'll leave you with uh, a, a list, a, a link. This is an inverse problems library that was used to compute um, to automate the generation of these adjoints and Hessian actions. Uh, the actual uh, projected um, neural network code, uh, Tom's code, it, that is a plug-in to TensorFlow uh, is available um, from, well, here's a paper and the paper has the link to the, the GitHub site. Uh, there's also a second order optimization algorithms that we use for training. Uh, we, we don't, we actually, for our problems, they, 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 um, they do a lot better than, than Adam or, or stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and then finally, here are some references on the ice sheets. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry for going a bit over. And if we have time, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you again. So thanks, Omar. It, it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Uh, we do have about two minutes. Uh, there is some delay, so it may take a minute for the questions to come in. So perhaps in, in the meantime, maybe I'll ask one. Okay. Um, so you know, I, I, I saw your the accuracy uh, plot for your your neural network surrogate. Um, my my question is, you know, are the are the sensitivities to uncertainty also accurate? So if you if you if you run, I don't know if that makes sense, but like if if you you didn't show how the posterior would compare for the for the neural network, you know, uh, posteriors versus the brute force, you know, how, how do those two compare? Yeah, Does no, the neural no. network preserve the, the sensitivity uh, of, this, of the actual physical system to uncertainty? Yeah, and so that's an excellent question. 
And um, just because you have an accurate parameter observable map, um, you know, ultimately what we care about, I mean, you could say even, you know, what we care about is the mean and covariance. Uh, so this is, that's quite slow. So let me go back to the pictures. This is probably the best way to do it. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the question then is, um, we have an accurate, uh, where is it? Here it is. So we have an accurate um, surrogate for Q of M, but the question is, how does that map into a, um, into a representation of, of the posterior? Um, and, uh, you know, so yeah, I don't, I don't have numerical evidence for that right now, uh, but um, what, what we can say is generally, because we're sampling this distribution and averaging over many points, um, it, you know, my feeling is it, it should be just as accurate uh, that, that, that um, you know, in going from Q of M to the posterior, it should also be just as accurate. And, you know, there've been many, you know, there's a ton of work on, um, on surrogates used for Bayesian um, in, inversion uh, and the effect of approximations. Uh, and so generally the, the, you know, the, the approximation error you get in the surrogate um, carries over and you get the, sort of the same order of approximation uh, in the posterior itself. Um, but for this particular thing, yeah, I haven't, we haven't done that calculation, but that's, that's an excellent question. Okay. Well, thanks for your answer. And uh, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, so we, we won't have time for any more questions, but please get in, in, in uh, touch with Professor Gattas if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you.